Okay, <coughs> so now we're going to be in section 2.5 for a little bit. It is called quadratic and rational inequalities. Okay. So before we before we do that, I want to point something out that I think really logically should have already been pointed out in the book, but it's not been pointed out yet. <coughs> and that is the following. I want to illustrate it first with an example. Okay, so for example, here is a quadratic equation. X squared plus x minus 6 is equal to 0. So we already have solved this equation, this exact equation once today, <laughs> okay, and probably two or three times this semester. So then it can be solved by factoring, right, x plus 3 multiplied by x minus 2 is equal to 0. Okay, so then there are two solutions. Right, x is negative 3, or x is 2. Okay, so are th is there any question about this computation? Okay, so that's if you want to solve it by factoring. <coughs> that's if you want to solve it by factoring. So now, let's do it a different way. Let's solve it with the quadratic equation. Okay, so if we were to use the quadratic, or the quadratic formula, I mean, if we were to use the quadratic formula, then we'd take the coefficients a is what? 1, b is 1, and c is negative 6, right? And just plug it into the quadratic formula, and don't worry about it. So then the first thing that I always do when I'm doing the quadratic formula is I check the determinant, or the discriminant, I mean. Uh, b squared minus 4ac. So, now, before we get any further, before we get any further, let me ask a conceptual question now. We've already solved this problem once, right, on the left side. How many solutions did it have? Two solutions. So, if the universe is fair and just, <laughs> and it is, mostly, then this discriminant, we should calculate it to be what? Should it be positive, negative, or zero? Positive. Okay, why? Because, right, that's what we said, right? When a quadratic has two solutions, it has a positive discriminant. When it has one solution, its discriminant is zero. And when it has no solutions, its discriminant is negative. So then let's... Let's, you know, cross our fingers here. All right, so then this should be 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 6. Okay, so then what is that? After you evaluate it. 25, all right. So that's good. All right, so it, at least it agrees it's positive, so then according to that, right, there should be two solutions. Okay, so the solutions are x is negative b, right? Negative b, right? You remember it? Okay, and then plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a, right? Those are the solutions. <coughs> so x is uh, what? Negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 25 over 2a, if it's a is 1, just over 2. Okay, so then x is negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 25 is 5 over 2. So what are the two solutions? So negative 1 minus 5 over 2, or x is negative 1 plus 5 over 2. So what's negative 1 minus 5? Negative 6. And then divided by 2 is negative 3. Okay. 
or negative 1 plus 5 is positive 4 over 2 is 2. Right? Okay, so then the two things agree with each other. The two things agree with each other. But now, you know, I have a question for you. I want you to uh, make an observation, and it's an observation that, in my experience, students sort of overlook. Right? Many students can go in this direction. No problem. If you have a factorized polynomial, right, it's obvious that the solutions are thus. But what about going in the opposite direction? If the solutions are negative 3 and positive 2, then this is how it factors. Right? So then this, using the quadratic formula, we didn't do any factoring. We didn't do any factoring. But nevertheless, this tells you, this tells you that the original thing must have factored like this. x plus 3, well let's say it like this, x minus negative 3 multiplied by x minus 2 is 0, right? x minus the one solution multiplied by x minus the other solution, okay? And then usually, right, you don't write x minus negative 3, you write x plus 3. So, you know, what if, <coughs> what if, I gave you a different example, and I said, find a polynomial, uh, no, not a polynomial, find a quadratic equation with solutions, x equal to 1 half, and x equal to 5. So find a quadratic equation with those solutions. And so now, I understand, I'm asking the question, but in the opposite order. Normally, it's here's a quadratic equation, find its solutions. Now I'm asking you the question in the reverse order. Here are the solutions, find a quadratic equation. So this is like Jeopardy now. <laughs> the game show Jeopardy. Okay, so then what? How do you do this? Foil what? There's nothing. If I'm going to foil something, I need to have the product of binomials. And I don't see any binomials. Okay, good. X minus half. And then what? Multiplied by X minus 5 equal to 0. So then now we can FOIL this out, okay, and get x squared minus 1 half x uh, minus 5 x plus 5 halves is equal to 0. Okay, so then that's x squared <coughs> and then minus 10 halves minus 1 halves is negative 11 halves x plus five halves is equal to zero. And then if you're being a math instructor, you could multiply it both sides of the equation by two. And you could say that, well, I'll say x squared minus 11 halves x plus five halves is zero. And I'll multiply both sides by two. And so zero multiplied by two is zero. And if you multiply the left-hand side by 2, you get 2x squared minus 11x plus 5. There's a quadratic equation with integer coefficients that has solutions 1 half and 5. <coughs> Understand this is exactly what, what I'm doing, right? <laughs> when I make a question, you know, I don't, I don't just randomly write down a quadratic and, and then check, right? I, I decide at the front, at the beginning, what I want the solutions to be. Today, I want the solutions to be 7 and 3, or whatever. Okay, and then I do this. 
and then you don't see any of the intermediate work. I just give you the last thing, right? I give you this and say, now solve it. You know, solve that equation. Okay, now this one, right, would be kind of, you know, possibly aggravating to solve by factoring. Okay. Do what? Yeah, you could write 2x minus 1. That would be perfectly fine. And then you wouldn't have to deal with uh, the fraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, <coughs> what I'm trying to get across on this, across to you on this page, is that you know the solution to a quadratic equation, okay, are in direct correspondence to the factors in a quadratic equation. Okay, so factoring is equivalent to solving is e and they're equivalent to each other. So if you have the solutions to, an equ to a quadratic equation, then you have the factors of a quadratic equation. And similarly, if you have the factors, then you have the solutions. So if you have one, you have both. Okay, good. So any question about this observation? Okay, <coughs> now we're going to deal with something entertaining. Okay, this is going to be called a quadratic inequality. Okay. <coughs> so, the following is a quadratic inequality in standard form. ax squared plus bx plus c is greater than zero. Right, this greater than, right, this could be, it could be less than, it could be greater than or equal to, it could be less than or equal to. Right, one of those four things. But it's in standard form, it's in standard form because the right hand side is zero. So it's quadratic, and then an inequality symbol, greater than, greater than or equal to, less than, less than or equal to, zero. Okay, so it's in standard form. Okay, so we're going to learn how to solve these inequalities, these kinds of inequalities. <coughs> okay, but, and it, it's quite a, we're going to go through this, it's very mechanical and very linguistic, so it's like, lots of math sentences, but I want to draw for you the pictures in case there are those of you that are picture people, like I'm a picture person, so that we're all clear about the story. Okay, there's only a few possibilities. Okay, so here they are. <coughs> so quadratic, I'll, I'll deal with greater than zero, and then you can use your imagination to deal with the rest of them, the rest of the possibilities. So these three possibilities I'm going to draw correspond to the three possibilities of the discriminant. Okay, the discriminant has three possibilities. It is either negative, or it is zero, or it is positive. Okay. So if the discriminant is negative, how many solutions are there? Zero solutions, because you can't compute square roots of negative numbers. that corresponds to the question, right? The graph of a quadratic is a parabola. How many times does this parabola cross the line? No times, right? Zero times. It doesn't cross the line, so there are no solutions. So now I have a question for you. <coughs> uh, you know, for what values of x is the parabola over the line? All values of x, right? No matter what. 
no matter what, the parabola is always over this. Right? The para parabola is always over it. Okay. Similarly, how about this parabola? Uh, no, not that one. I got oop. this one. Okay, so then this corresponds to discriminant is what? Exactly equal to zero. Okay, now I have a question. This is sort of a tricky question, a legal question. For what for what values of x is the parabola over the line? Well, almost. So, so it's the exact opposite of that. For every value of x except this one, right? Because at this one point, it's touching the line, so it's not over it. But at every other value of x, it's over it, right? The parabola is over the line. The parabola is over the line. Over the line. Over the line. Over the line. Except for this one place. Okay. <coughs> and then finally, what's the last possibility for the discriminant? The discriminant might be greater than zero. Okay, so in this case, the parabola could look something like this. Okay, <coughs> so th there are two solutions, that one and that one. So now, where, for what values of x is the parabola over the line? Okay, so how about, is it over the line here? No, it's under, here. So then anywhere between these two, it's under. Anywhere between these two, it's under. And anywhere outside of these two, it's over. Right, so then these, these things <coughs> okay, that we'll get used to in the next chapter when we're dealing with uh, graphs and get more comfortable with the pictures of these things, you'll find out that, well, this parabola that I've drawn this parabola that I'm drawn is positive everywhere. So it's it's positive for all values of x. Right? No matter where you check, it's positive. Okay, this parabola is positive almost everywhere. It's positive everywhere except this one value where it's zero. Right? It's zero at one place. It's zero at one place. And then this parabola is positive here on the left part, and it's positive here on the right part. Okay, but in between the two, in between the two solutions, it's not positive, it is negative, right? Negative, 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 negative. So now, <coughs> the reason why I'm drawing this is because I want to point out the, what is it that we're trying to solve? We're trying to solve a quadratic inequality. So now, have a look at this picture. Right, now that the picture is drawn, where is the quadratic positive? Here and here. Okay. Where is the quadratic negative? Here. Okay. How about this? Where is this quadratic positive? Right, it's quadratic. It, it's positive on the left. It's positive. It's positive on the right. Is it positive here? No, it's not positive here. It's zero here. Okay, and then finally, where is this quadratic positive? Everywhere, right? So it's what we're doing, we're going to algebraically solve this, okay? And then, you know, the gears in my head, as they're turning, this is what I'm seeing, right? I see one of these, these pictures, okay? And then finally, right, <coughs> you know, these three parabolas, these three parabolas that I drew, they all open up, okay? But just as well, we could have parabolas that open down, those are just as legitimate parabolas. Right, so I'll sketch them for you very rapidly.
basically the same story, right? This parabola, where is it negative? The bottom left parabola, where is it negative? Everywhere. It's negative for every x. Okay, this parabola, the middle parabola, is negative for almost every x. Right, it's negative on the left side of its solution. It's negative on the right side of its solution. But it happens to be exactly equal to zero. Right? Exactly zero at its solution. Okay, and then this parabola is negative. There, it's negative. There. <coughs> and in between its two solutions, it is positive. So then the last thing to get qualitative understanding of quadratics before we finally start solving these inequalities is how do you tell quickly at a glance whether or not the parabola you're dealing with opens up or opens down? It's very easy to just look at it and detect. The sign of what? The sign of, not the sign of D, not the sign of the discriminant. That doesn't, that tells you how many solutions there are, but not whether it opens up or down. Ah, the x squared term. Right, the x squared term. This, this row is what happens when A is positive. Right, so when A is positive, so positive people, are they smiling or are they frowning? Smiling, right? So if you have a positive leading coefficient, then the parabola opens up. Okay, and then if A is negative, are negative people smiling or frowning? Frowning, right? So if the leading coefficient is negative, then it opens down. Okay, good. So any questions about these things before we get to actual solving these things? I just want to make sure you have a qualitative understanding of what's happening right, before we do this. We're, what we're going to do is we're going to have quadratic inequalities and we're going to diagnose which of these six cases we're in. <coughs> so, probably the best way, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the best way to go about doing this is just by example, I think. So let's start out with a very simple example. The same one we've done so many times. X squared plus X minus 6 is, uh, let's say, greater than zero. Greater than zero. Okay, now, what we're going to do is we're going to factor this as if this was an equation. Is this an equation? No, it's, it's an inequality. But we're going to factor it as if it's an equation. Okay, so then <coughs> I'm going to deal with it as if it's an equation. x squared plus x minus 6 is equal to 0, so then I will get x plus 3, x minus 3 is equal to 0, so there are two solutions, uh, excuse me, x plus 3 and x minus 2 is what I mean to say. So x is negative 3 or x is 2, right? Alternatively, you could have arrived at these two solutions if you aren't good at factoring or it was the numbers were too bad and you didn't want to do guess and check because there were going to be a million possibilities, what else could you have used? The quadratic formula. So at any rate, this is a quadratic with two solutions. Okay, so then does this quadratic open up or does it open down? Okay, I agree that it opens up. Why does it open up? Right, because A is 1, is positive. So we we are expecting a quadratic that looks like so. So it looks like so. And we want to know we want to know where the quadratic is positive. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so what this is telling us is if we take the algebraic approach, then the inequality looks like so. X uh, plus three multiplied by x minus 2 is positive. 
right? That's what we need to solve. So if we want, if we want the product to be positive, if we want the product to be positive, then what has to be true about both of those terms? So what if both of those terms was positive? Would it be positive? Yeah, then the product would be positive. Is that the only possibility? Is it the only possibility? Like if you have two things, A and B, if A and B are both positive, then their product is positive. What else can happen? Both negative. Oh, they could both be negative. So if they're both negative, then the product could be positive. <coughs> okay. So then the way you do this is like so. We'll consider x, the term x plus 3 is equal to 0. <coughs> x plus 3 is equal to 0. So then, or just x plus 3, really. If you draw this and you make a cut, <coughs> okay, make a cut at each one of the solutions, x equal to negative 3 and x equal to 2, then let's, let's write what happens to x plus, x plus 3. So if you choose something in here, if you choose something in here, for example, negative 4, what, so what is, something, what is something that's in this region to the left of negative 3? What's something to the left of negative 3? Negative 10, right? Negative 10 is to the left. So then x plus 3, will that be, uh, if you plug in negative 10, will that be positive or negative? Negative, right? It will be negative. Negative, 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 negative. Okay, what if you plug in something to the right of negative 3? So if you plug in and between 2. So what if, what's a number that's in here? What's the number that's in here? One. One is in here. So what if you plug in one? Then one plus three is, what's the SIGN of one plus three? Positive, right? So it'll be positive in here. Okay, what about, what's something to the right of two? To the right of two, something greater than two. A thousand. <laughs> okay, he likes a thousand. Okay, so if you plug in a thousand, one thousand plus three, what's the what's the sign of one thousand plus three? Positive, right? So positive. Okay, so then the other factor is x minus two. Okay, so what's something we can plug into x minus two that's to the left of negative three? What's something we can plug in? Anything to the left of negative three. How about negative ten? Well we'll use that. Okay, so the negative 10 minus 2 is negative 12. What's the sign of negative 12? Negative. Okay, we'll plug in 1 into x minus 2. So if you plug in 1 into x minus 2, you get 1 minus 2, which is negative 1, which is negative. Okay, and then we can plug in 1,000. 1,000 minus 2 is some number, I don't know. And then whatever it is, is it positive or negative? Positive. Okay, so now we consider products. We consider products. So, the overall product, right, negative and negative, the product of two negative things is what? Positive, right? So, this will be positive. Okay, and how about the product of positive and negative? What will this be? Negative. Okay, and then the product of positive and positive will be positive. So now, 
what we've done is we've figured out the sign, the sign of each of these things. Okay, so we wanted to know when the quadratic was, if you look at the top of the question, we wanted to know when the quadratic was, was what? Was positive. We wanted to know where it is positive. So now have a look at the last chart that we made. Where is it positive? the right. So now I have a question for you. What about exactly at 2? Is it positive there? Is it positive at exactly at 2? No. Okay, what, what is it exactly at 2? It's 0. It's 0 exactly at 2. What about uh, at negative 3? Is it positive at negative 3? No. It's 0 at negative 3. Okay, so the solution So the solution is x less than negative 3 or x greater than 2. And if I asked you to write this in interval notation, how would you write it? So how would you write this first part? So negative infinity, and then what? Negative 3, and do we include negative 3? No. Okay, how, <coughs> how do you write the second part? 2 to infinity, right, good. And then how do you indicate that either one of these is okay? What is the, what is the algebraic symbol? Right, U, right, a big U, union. This stands for a union. Okay, so then I'd like to point out that it is, right, the symbol is this, not this. <laughs> right? The letter, okay, in some fonts, the letter U in some fonts in the English language has a foot, right, a stare. Okay, but the mathematical symbol has no foot, no stare. Okay, now, this this left column, this is what the book prescribes for you to do. It's a perfectly legitimate thing. But let me tell you the way this problem works in my head. Okay, so then I take a look at this. I see, I see that I'm solving a quadratic, and I can see that it opens up. There are exactly three possibilities. Right? The three possibilities are this one, this one, this one. It may be that it is always positive, it may be that it is positive except for one value, or it may be that it is positive outside of two solutions. Right, so which one did we get? The third one, right? You can see from the pattern over here that we got this one. Okay, so have the, you should have the understanding right, of what happened. Right? So then you can see that, ah, well this is a quadratic, it opens up, it has two solutions, it has to be it has to be this one. Right, the solution has to look like that. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, <coughs> now let's solve something more interesting. Or just as interesting, but different. Okay, so the way we did it, the way we solved the last one was as we said, okay, I'm going to find all of these different places to cut. I'm going to find all the different places to cut the number line and then solve accordingly. So let's solve another one. Mm, how about... Mm, do I like that one? No, I don't like that one. <coughs> that one obscures the point. Okay, so let's do this one. Uh, yeah. X squared plus 2x minus 24 is less than 0. Okay, so just like the last time, we'll factor this. So then this one factors pretty easily. How does it factor? Yes, x plus 6 and what? x minus 4. Good. 
So then again, you know, in your head, you should be thinking, ah, this is a quadratic inequality. This quadratic opens up or down? Up. And I want to know where it's negative. So I want to know where it's negative. So there's only a few possibilities. All right, since it opens up, it may never be negative. That's a legitimate thing. It could never be negative. Okay, and again, it could never be negative, right? So then this, the middle quadratic, is never negative. It's always positive except for where it's zero at the one place, so it's never negative. Or it could be this. Okay, so you, sh you should already be able to tell which case we're in. So which case are we in? The third case. The third case, because this quadratic has two, uh, it has two solutions because it has two factors. Okay, <coughs> so then now let's make that chart that we made on the previous question. Okay, so then where do the cuts need to go? Oh, nice. Some, something's crashing. I don't know what's crashing. Oh, okay, the that program's crashing. Understand why this thing crashes all the time. Oh, and so I lost all of that. Okay, great. Okay, so then just quickly now, without discussion, I'll just write down what we had. Okay, so what we had was this example x squared plus 2x minus 20 24 negative. We factored it into x plus 6, x minus 4 negative. And then I asked, where do the cuts go? So where do the cuts go? Right, x is negative 6 and x is positive 4. Okay, so then now let's do the possibilities, right? X plus six. So what what is a value that's to the left of negative six? How about negative ten? Okay, something between negative six and positive four. Okay, so you gotta speak loud, I can't hear. So something between negative six and four? Two, great. And then something to the right of four? Ten. Okay, so then now, if you plug in negative 10 into x plus 6, what do you get? Something negative, right? Negative. If you plug in 2 into x plus 6, what do you get? Something positive. If you plug in 10 into x plus 6, you get something positive. Now let's do the other term. The other term is x minus 4. So if you plug in negative 10 into x minus 4, you get something negative. If you plug in 2 into x minus 4, you get something negative. If you plug in 10 into x minus 4, you get something positive. Okay, so then all together, when you consider all possible products, product of two negative things is positive. The product of positive and negative is negative. The product of positive and positive is positive. So then, we wanted to know when the, equ when the thing was negative. Okay, so then, so the solution is what? So where is it negative? between the cuts, between those two cuts. So negative 6 less than x less than 
four. So should it be less than or less than or equal to? Which one should it be? Which one? Less than, right? It should be strictly less than because we asked for negative, right? And if you were to write this in interval notation, how would you write it? Negative six to four, not including either one. Okay, so any question about this example? Okay, <coughs> now let's do something <coughs> a little more interesting because now there's I'm going to start throwing uh, you know, curveballs a little bit. So for example, for example, how about 2x minus 1 uh, over x plus 5 is greater than or equal to 0? So this, is this a quadratic? No, this isn't a quadratic. In fact, this is a what kind of thing? What kind of function is this? What is it? R. Rational, right? This is a rational function because it is a ratio of polynomials. It's a rational function. So then this inequality is said to be a rational inequality. Okay. So then the strategy, the strategy last time, the strategy last time was we wanted to find everywhere the quadratic was zero. Right? And then we had the cut. Right? We said we're gonna cut here, we're gonna cut here, and then test in between the cuts, etc. So what's going to be the strategy for a rational inequality? So the strategy will be similar, slightly different. The strategy will be find all places where the numerator is 0 to 0, or the denominator is 0, and use those as cuts. The reason why this works is because this is, because there's a zero on one side, so if one of the sides is zero, this is said to be in standard form. So if there's not a zero on one of the sides, before you do this, before you do this thing of finding the cuts and blah, 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 you must put it in standard form first. Okay, it needs to be put into standard form. Okay, so then let's <coughs> do this. So then 2x minus 1 is 0, so that's finding the, the numerator is 0. So then 2x is equal to 1, so x is 1 half. Okay, so shouldn't be much question about that. And then the denominator, right, x plus 5 is 0, so that x is negative 5. So now we proceed just like just like we, we did previously. Right, so draw a number line. So what are the cuts in this problem? One half and negative five. So now I'm going to make a kind of funny error. But nevertheless, I've seen very good students make this error and become totally confused. Yeah, it's supposed to be the other way. But, you know, I know it's, it's kind of silly when you're watching me up here and I say, okay, I'm going to make a mistake. Now, what was the mistake? But I see students all the time, okay, good ones, you know, students who, who make, who, om who miss almost nothing, who write this down and then they put negative six here. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay, no. Right, so then <coughs> be very careful. I, I imagine the reason why this happens is because, right, 
here's the one half, so I'll put it on the left, and here's the negative five, so I'll put it on the right. That's my imagination of what happened. At any rate, just be careful. Okay, so now you need to choose a value to the left of negative five. What do you think? Negative ten. Great. Something between negative five and half? Zero. Something to the right of half? One. <coughs> okay. So now there are two expressions. Right, there's two x minus one. Okay, so then now, if you plug in negative ten into two x minus one, what do you get? You get something negative, right? You get negative 21. So negative. Okay, if you plug in 0 into 2x minus 1, what do you get? Something negative. And if you plug in 1 into 2x minus 1, you get something positive. Okay, so any question about how we arrive here? Okay. So then next, uh, green, I suppose. Yeah, that'll be good. Okay, so then the next term was x plus 5. So if you plug in negative 10 into x plus 5, what do you get? Something negative. So negative. Okay, if you plug in 0 into x plus 5, you get something positive. And if you plug in 1 into x plus 5, you get something positive. OK. So then now, we're not multiplying these two terms. We're dividing these two terms. Okay. So then the ratio of two negative things is what? Positive or negative? The ratio is positive. The ratio of two negative things is positive. This ratio will be negative. This ratio will be positive. Okay, so now you go back to the inequality and you ask, right? What what and you observe what was being asked. I want to know where it's greater than or equal to zero. Greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that means I'm interested in the positive parts. Right, so you can you should be able to see by now. Okay, it is not greater than or equal to zero in the middle. Okay, but now I'm going to write something that's wrong. Okay, and you need to tell me why it's wrong. So the solution is. So I look back up, I want the positive things, and I have a look and it says, ah, greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so then since it's greater than or equal to zero, I'm not going to be using round parentheses, I'm going to be using square ones, right? Okay, so let's see if that's really true. So then x is less than or equal to negative five, or x is greater than or equal to one half. Right, so I'm using the greater than or equal to because I was using the the greater than or equal to at the top, but this, even though it feels right, is wrong. Why is this wrong? There's something, something, something is amiss, right? So I'll give you a hint. This is good. <laughs> so the error. The error is somewhere here. Hmm. So let's think. Something something in there, right? X is less than or equal to negative 5. Could you plug in negative 6? Can you plug in negative 6 into this inequality? Yeah, you can plug negative 6 in there. If you do... You get negative 13 divided by negative 1, which is positive 13, right, which is greater than or equal to 0. 
But there's something you cannot plug into that inner five. You cannot plug in negative five. Why can you not plug in negative five? Because you would be dividing by zero. So what, what is the problem? This one, right? This needs to be strictly less than. Right, so I told you a curveball was coming, right? There was a curveball, and that, that was it. Okay, so then the machine, particularly, right, you'll have questions like this. The machine will, you know, you'll have to type things in. The machine, in particular, will just tell you, no. Right, it won't tell you, well, you should think about it, and blah, blah. It's not going to say any of that. It's just going to say, no. Okay. So then if you wanted to write this in interval notation, how would you write it? So negative infinity to negative 5, not including negative 1. And 1 half to infinity. Okay, and then union. <coughs> so any question about this example? Okay, so then now, you know, I will try to, I will mostly avoid the following kind of situation, but understand that I can give you a situation like this. You know, I give you, oops, I give you some number line, I give you some question, and somehow, you know, you have a number line that looks like this. You know, here's a one cut, another cut, another cut, another cut, another cut. So all the previous questions all had two cuts. I can give you as many cuts as I wish, right? 24,000 cuts. Of course, I'm not going to do that. That would be absurd. Okay, but then, you know, I could give you lots of different expressions, right? So then one expression, another expression, another expression, another expression, right? And then you might determine that, you know, this one is negative, this one's negative, this one's positive, this one's negative. And you just keep going through, right? Methodically, making out this table carefully, one piece, one little cutted piece at a time. And then you, then you at the end, say, okay, now I compute all of the products, right? What would the product here be? Would it be positive or negative for this one column that I did? It'd be negative, right? Because negative times negative is positive, times positive is positive, times negative is negative. So net result, it would be negative. Okay, and then I could make the, the other five columns be anything that I wanted. I'm totally arbitrary, right? And that's how I design these problems. Is I say, how many cuts do I want? I want three cuts, and then I make three cuts. And then what do I want the signs to be? And blah, 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 I do that. So then this is how problems, I, I want to illustrate this, this to you so that you see how problems are constructed because basically the way this class goes is I construct a problem and then you, it's your task to deconstruct it. And I want to look and make sure that you're doing it formulaically, right, very clearly. Okay, so any question about these things? Okay, so we're going to foreshadow just a little bit of stuff that we're going to talk about on <coughs> Thursday, and then that will be the end of the class. So any question about inequality, quadratic and rational inequalities? So before, let's just look at one real quick, and I want you to tell me how you would go about doing it. We won't actually do it. How about, <coughs> how about this one? X squared minus 9 divided by uh, X squared minus 16 is less than 0. Would you go about solving it? What was it? Factor, okay. So I'll factor, I suppose you want me to factor the numerator and the denominator, so I'll factor it. Right, you find the zeros of the numerator and the zeros of the denominator. Right, you would have something that looks like this. <coughs> Four cuts. So x is negative 4. x 
is negative 3, x is 3, x is 4. So here's a good question. <laughs> Sometimes there's a student that is not sure what the answer is. What's, a, what's something between 3 and 4? 3 and a half, right? Believe it or not, hey, there are some people who at this level forget that there are numbers between 3 and 4, right? Not everything is an integer. Some things aren't, and that's okay. Right? Not everything has to be an integer, okay, etc. Okay, so then now, the last one I want to test your understanding how, how you would proceed. <coughs> so, for example, how would you proceed on this one? What would you do? <coughs> so do what? I agree. You would subtract one from both sides first. Why would you do that? Because you want there to be a zero on one of the sides. Right? All of the things that we have done rely on there being a zero on sides. If there is not a zero on one of the sides, then all of the things that we've said today about inequalities is not true. Just like, you know, just like this example that I, you know, that I said, you know, x, it was something like this: x plus two multiplied by x minus three is equal to four hundred. Does that mean that one of those two terms is equal to four hundred? No, no. The only time that works is when the right-hand side is zero. It doesn't work when the right-hand side is 400 or 4 million or any other number that's not 0. So if you wanted to proceed on this one, you would have to say, well, this is 3x over x minus 1 minus 1 is less than 0. Now what? So now what? Okay, you could set it equal to 0, but I would recommend doing something else. You could do that but I would recommend something else, turning it into a single rational expression. Okay, that is to say, find the common denominator. So you could say that this is 3x over x minus 1 minus x minus 1 over x minus 1 is less than 0. Then it would be all over x minus 1. So then it would be 3x minus x minus 1 is less than 0. So that you have 3x minus x is 2x, and then minus 1 over x minus 1 is less than 0. So now, in this position, right now, this is a rational inequality that is in, this in the same kind that we've done previously. So now, now you begin what we already started, what we already know how to do. So the difference between this question and the previous question is that you had to do, you know, one, two, three algebraic steps to get it into a standard form before you proceed with the things that were said previously. So it requires a little bit of work before you do that. Okay. So then now, the last thing to just foreshadow what will happen so you can think about it for a little bit. Section 2.6 is called substitution. So then, I won't get into the formal details of it. I'll just start out with an example. If the perimeter of a square is 32 inches, then find the area. So on a, on a problem like this, typically I like to draw, you know, a sketch. Okay, so then I, there I have a square, something that I intend to be a square. What, what is the perimeter of a square? What is, what is that? Like in, in an English sentence. Yeah, the length of the whole thing, right? If I was to take that square, if it was made out of some material and I could cut it and straighten it out, make it a straight line, the perimeter is the length, all 
way around. Okay, so if we call this x, right, x, 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 all of those measurements are x because this is a square. And if I call the perimeter p, then what is p? p is 4x. And that's its perimeter. What is its area? So if I call the area A, what is A? It's x squared. <coughs> okay. So we have these two we have these two things, and we also know what is the last thing we know? We also know that P is equal to thirty two. So using these these pieces of information, right, you want to solve for A, right? Find the area, solve for A. Okay, so in order to do that, you can first solve for X, right? You have P is 4X, and you also have that P is 32. So 4X is 32. So x is equal to 32 over 4, which is 8. Okay, so now you can say that a is x squared, and now you can substitute the solution 8 for that. So that tells you that a is 64, because that's 8 squared. Okay, so this procedure of finding, you know, uh, we've got multiple variables going on. We've got P, we've got A, we've got X, and we find the one and substitute it into the other and keep doing this kind of thing. Generally, this is called substitution, and that's what the next section is about. Okay, see you on Thursday. <coughs>